uh, for FMA Discussion, uh, episode 290. And tonight, we've got Kevin Goat, okay, from Calgary, Canada. Hi, Kevin. Hey, How Very are you good, thank that? you. Very good. Thanks for having me on. Okay. It's a pleasure to have you. And... Um, in, in FMA discussion, and thanks to Brian Rodriguez. He'll be jumping in in about 20 minutes' time, okay, for the interview. Awesome. Okay. How are, how are things going in Canada at the moment? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty loaded question, but, you know, life is returning a little bit back to normal, so we're doing pretty good. So okay. classes are, uh, people are feeling more comfortable getting back into training, which is nice. I mean, there was a massive, obviously, hit to my adult program, uh, at the start of COVID, where everybody was just scared to train. So uh, the program took a big hit there. And But uh, other than that, I mean, the kids program blew up and it helped keep me in business, which is fantastic. I know a lot of local people who had to shut down their dojos for good, which is uh, yeah. which pretty hard, right? But, but now uh, everything's opening back up and people want to get back to training. So it's nice to see class sizes are continuing to grow and excitement's uh, building again. So it's great. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah. Do you still have some degree of like uh, restrictions, like using mask in some places? No, no. I, I mean, I think there's some on like city transit and things like that. But overall, uh, everybody's pretty decent. Um, and it, it's it's choice right now if people want to wear a mask, like in a grocery store or training or things like that. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So during the during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic, did you do like yeah. online classes? Yeah, so students, we, yeah. we tried to stay open whenever we were allowed to open. It was literally like every week uh, something was switching with our government. So some days we were allowed to train, some days we weren't allowed to train. If you were under 18, you're allowed to train. If you're over 18, mm, you weren't. So, yeah. um, so we, we went back and forth quite a bit. Um, we I switched to the Zoom online format for a while, and that worked pretty good. Um, we we kept the numbers kind of at a baseline where it was paying for the bills. Mm -hmm. And then when society opened back up a little bit and then things really started to, to get the ball rolling, a lot of people were concerned about a smaller space. And I had quite a small dojo at the time. I just moved out on my own uh, or teaching on my own, I should say, a year before uh, the COVID hit. So I was still very fresh and very new. Um, so when things opened back up, I decided to actually get to a larger space. So we doubled the mm -hmm. size of the space. And uh, now I'm in Silver Springs, Northwest Calgary, and it's about 2,000 square feet. So uh, numbers are growing. The kids program is doing phenomenally well. We have like 90 plus people on the wait wow. list for the program. Uh, the adult program is consistently building, but most of the adults have actually switched to private lessons. Okay. So compared to being in the group classes. So um, a lot of the Filipino martial arts that I do uh, is almost all private lesson based now. Okay. Yeah, where so before, in, yeah. yeah, sorry, go yeah. So in your, in, your, in your gym, what are yeah. the classes that you offer? So I teach uh, traditional uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, traditional Filipino martial arts, traditional Wing Chun Kung Fu, um, and then my main program, which is kind of the success of the business, is the program that I created, the Gong Fu program, which is specifically a self-defense based program itself. Uh, that incorporates boxing, kickboxing, taekwondo kicking, um, some karate, uh, some BJJ, I, especially in the kids program. I'm just mm -hmm. introducing them into BJJ and then the adult program has a lot of that, but the BJJ isn't competitive, so it's um, yeah, I would more label it as ground fighting and your ability to get back up to your feet okay. if you're taken down to the ground. So obviously we're using Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for that. Yeah. And then the Gong Fu program also has weapon elements as well, but it's more of the practical side of weapons mm -hmm. training than it is necessarily the, um, the artsy side yeah. of Filipino martial arts. So, yeah. yeah okay. Oh, sounds brilliant, man. So yeah, we'll 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 hear more of that later on as as we talk about yeah. your journey. Okay, so but before we go, but we go with we we talk more about you. Uh, let's welcome everybody who has been uh, was uh, who have tuned in. So we have Kyle, we have Dean Franco, and we got Steve Irvin. So good evening, guys. If you're watching this podcast, please smash the heart button. And if you if you have any question for Kevin later on. Please don't hesitate to put it in the comment box. And 
of course, if you miss this interview, you always have the YouTube channel to go to. Okay. All right. Um, also, tell us where, we, where you are watching from, guys. Tell us where you're watching from. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, Kev, let's start. Um, how did you start your journey into martial arts? Uh, well, I'm 38 years old now. Uh, I was a little shit as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I needed some discipline, that's for sure. So um, my mom and dad put me into karate and taekwondo uh, All right. at the young age of, I think, five or six years old. I did that for quite some time. Uh, we ended up moving away. So I grew up in Northeast Calgary and our like car was stolen and our truck was stolen and our next door neighbor's house was broken into our other next door neighbor's house was broken into. And my mom was like, enough of this crime. Let's move to a nicer part of the city. So we <laughs> ended up moving to uh, Northwest Calgary to Silver Springs actually where I'm teaching now, which is kind of cool. Um, and then it was too far me for me to go and travel to my Taekwondo sensei, Gary Lloyd. Um, so I took about probably a year or two off after that. Uh, I had some friends who were at Mike Miles kickboxing, the Smanage brothers. And um, so I did kickboxing for like a year or two, took a couple of years off because I was 16 and I got into cars and girls and- <laughs> All right, okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then um, I got into sales. I was doing well with sales. I was making at the time like $90,000 a year. And I started training Kung Fu again and they had asked if I would like to start teaching within about mm -hmm. six months of being there. So um, my mom was pissed because I said yes, and I, I turned it all down to, <laughs> to teach Kung Fu for six bucks an hour, right? And it may not have been the most wise financial decision, but I had always known that I, I loved martial arts. And if I could maybe help spread what I had felt within myself, what was driving and, and keeping me motivated, um, that, that was a pretty cool gift to have. So I started teaching until the age of 22. Uh, and then I joined the military. I did the military mm -hmm. for three years. Um, I never did any tours or anything like that. Did all the training to go up to the tour and then lost my tour. Um, came back from military and then I started getting into, well, everything. <laughs> uh, I met Tom Gillis, who was a law enforcement officer at the time. He was also a ninjutsu guy. Uh, he okay. kind of helped me kind of open up the door and, and show me, you know, that this whole other world of martial arts, because I was always predominantly a striker. You know, I, I'm six foot four. I had long ass arms. I was very oh, good. Okay. So I could keep people at distance very well. You know, there'd be times I punch somebody in the face and, you know, their fist is here. And I was like, <laughs> if I was tall, I would have got smashed. Right. So, so it was kind of cool. And it was right at the time when, uh, the UFC was starting to become popular and mm -hmm. uh, wrestling and BGJ were kind of this whole new thing that people weren't really seeing. So I was doing uh, law enforcement work at the time. I was working with a gentleman named Brian Willis at Winning Mind Training. Okay. He was the uh, main trainer for the CPS unit. And I kind of shadowed him for a while. And I went through those doors. I worked for the commissioners, creating some of their executive protection courses. Um, and it was, it was fun. It was good. Uh, nothing really paid the bills too well, to be honest. So I was trying my best to, to find work and to do other things. Um, Veteran Affairs ended up paying for me to go to school for two years. So I did uh, rehab therapy, so occupational okay. therapy and uh, physiotherapy. And during that time, uh, I was training Shaolin Kung Fu. I was doing Filipino martial arts. Um, that's when I met John Hen Arnees and Guru Joel Hongar. Um, obviously Guru Joel is like my brother. He's my mentor. He's my bro. Um, he really motivated me and inspired me to, to push the Filipino martial arts a lot. All right. Um, so his system was Arnees Dakadana, which I is actually currently going through a name change right now. I think he's going to be calling it Boondock Eskrima. Um, and it's, it's kind of his version of what he learned in Mati Arnis. And he kind of made it his own. And he, he really, it, it was really cool. But Joel always knew I was a bit of a renegade myself. So okay. he said, hey, like, I'm going to teach you my stuff. Do with it what you want. Play with it. So as much as he was traditional, he also knew that I was a pretty free spirit. 
and he allowed me to just kind of do my own thing with it. So all right, all right. I trained my ass off. I I always did. My body is sacrificed for it for sure. Um, and that's when I started getting into a lot of different styles of martial arts because everybody kept saying like, you're tall. I was working out at the time. You're big. You know, you can use your range against us. So almost mm -hmm. everybody is saying, you know, if we sparred, I just take you down to the ground and let's see what you got there. So that's when I realized there was five different ranges of martial arts. And, you know, if we just talk about it quick, we have our weapons range, yep. and even that can be broken down even smaller. You have your mm -hmm. kicking range, you have your boxing range, you have your trapping range, and then you have mm -hmm. your grappling range. Yep. So there was two martial arts there that I didn't really know a lot about. Filipino martial arts opened up my eyes a little bit to the trapping range and, you know, Cadena de Mayo. Um, but there wasn't really a specialist in it. You know, I played with some Chi Do for a while, thought it was pretty cool. It kind of molded everything together, but I really wanted to specialize in it. So then I chose Wing Chun, uh, okay. traveled the world to, to try and find the best Wing Chun. Um, I went to Hong Kong. I trained for a month straight there. I did BJJ there. I did some Filipino martial arts there. I did some MMA there and obviously tons of Wing Chun. Um, and I felt like it was good. It was, it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. um, I came back to Calgary and while I was in school, I was offered a job again to teach martial arts. Um, All right. And I mm -hmm. taught at a place that was very big. So at the time we had about 800 students. So absolutely massive organization. Um, it was cool because, you know, from going from teaching for $6 an hour to now having salary, and then to actually having benefits as a martial arts instructor, like that's unheard of. So it was nice. It gave me a lot of time to train. I really worked my butt off and I just kept training and training and training and training and learning lots of different styles of martial arts. Uh, eventually on one plane ride home, I was either from Sweden, might've been from Hong Kong. I actually uh, started writing up kind of my own system. And I said, you know, there's all these martial arts that are taking place. They all have advantages. They all have disadvantages. Mm -hmm. What is it that I want to create? And I didn't know it at the time that I actually wanted to create my own system, but I didn't really even know what it was that I was looking for. I just knew that there was something that I needed to, to put out into the world, something that yeah. I really believed in. Because, you know, being 6'4", 240 at the time, I could make any technique work, right? Because I was naturally athletic, because I had put so many skills or right, years of training into my skills. Yeah. I could somebody would show me something like, yeah, I can I can do that, right? Because there wasn't a lot of people bigger than me. But yeah. as the years went on, and I think I was approaching my 10th or 12th year teaching, um, all of a sudden I was like, hold on, well, this technique doesn't work for my five foot, five hundred and ten pound female student. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I was like, well, then why am I teaching this? Right. Yeah, because, that's true. Yeah. Well, and it's hard, right? Because like for me, if I'm super passionate about something, you'll see that when I teach, um, it's because I believe in it. It's because I believe it'll work. It's because it's a high percentage move yeah. or technique or something. Um, so I started just stripping away everything. And I always love Bruce Lee. Right? Bruce Lee is so intelligent, right, of, you know, strip away the unessential and train the essential, mm -hmm. right? And that really resonated with me. That really hit home because that gave me a chance to now start looking at all of my systems and yeah. being like, okay, what is it that I'm doing? Am I sparring or am I fighting? Because they're two different things. Am I doing yeah. martial or am I doing arts, right? Yeah. And everything was kind of it was all over the place. So it took a few years to kind of figure it out of exactly what I, what it was that I wanted to do. Um, and then I kind of came up with my own system. Well, I did. And at the time I was still like, I'm a, currently a brown belt in jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu under sensei Alex uh, Roque. And I knew I still needed to get better at jits. I knew that I had good jits at the time. At the time I was a blue belt. Um, but I needed to be better. I needed to mm -hmm. understand more of it. So there was a lot more work that I had to do. It, and that's why I love martial arts because when I started getting into martial arts that required sensitivity, feeling sensitivity, yeah. both hands, the ambidextrous side of things, um, 
my body was starting to get slower. <laughs> my, my speed that I was known for started to get slower. My movement started to get slower. And I was like, I'm not even 40 yet. Like what the hell's going on? <laughs> but, but I wait till I, you get to 50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what everybody says. That's what everybody says. It's a little scary. Right. Um, but it was, it was cool because all of a sudden now I had gone from arts like Taekwondo, kickboxing, karate, boxing, all those things um that require that youth that athleticism yeah. and now yeah. here i am doing martial arts like wing chong balin to walk um jujitsu that are all very much so close range martial arts mm -hmm. right and a lot of people are like you know why are you training these arts you don't live in a place your environment isn't dictating to be in a close range fighting system i mean you go to japan or sorry not japan you go to china you go to hong kong and you literally are packed onto yeah. a train, you're going to use a close range fighting system. But in Canada, we have this luxury of having so much space that you don't have to worry about it. So mm -hmm. I remember I was sparring some Wing Chun guys and they couldn't do any of their Wing Chun to me. And I was like, okay, well, why? Well, we're in a 2000 square foot dojo, right? So if I use my footwork, it works great. And you know, one of the guys was like, well, let's go to the bathroom. And I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, let's go to the bathroom, right? Let's let's see how you do now. <laughs> right. And and it was different, right? Now all of a sudden, all my kicking and all my long range strikes, uh, they didn't work so well. Mm. You know, and and they really opened up my eyes to okay, there's there's a lot more here. So there isn't one right or wrong martial arts. It's it's in the moment. It's it's gonna it, determine that's true. So that's well. very true. I do believe that as well. Yeah. I do believe that, yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. if you're, uh, sorry, if especially if you're basically wanting to really be skillful in 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 the practical side of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for sure, and I mean, you know, like I'd always heard the stories from my senseis growing up. Like I knew a guy that handled his own against this guy, and you know, he won this fight using this technique, and he won that. And it's like, mm. yeah, that's that's true. That was that I'm not calling your stories lies or anything like that, but there's so much more that dictate what happens when we're actually yeah. talking about. And like, I don't even like using the word practical martial art because it, it's not practical, right? It's everything is going to be determined by your environment and mm -hmm. your environment is usually dictated by your laws. Yeah. And then yeah. even then the military taught me is like, well, then you also have your own rules of engagement. Yep, because yes, if, if you're fine, like um, when the Buddha brothers and I um, did the collaboration and just put out um, our, our big self-defense thing, it was like we knew that 95% of our market was actually going to probably be out of the States. Mm -hmm. So at first I was like, you know, do I tailor this to be meant for the States or do I just make it for Canadian laws and kind of talk about both, but maybe not show the techniques for it? Yeah. yeah because yeah. I was always told when, when growing up and, and learning from my senseis and sifus and gurus was like, you don't want to teach somebody how to kill somebody. Like you, that's, you that's true. can you trust that person? Right. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of goes to those like secret Kung Fu hidden secrets, <laughs> right? like, you know, master Ugwe, right. And you're like, yeah, that... well, 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 why is it that they're hiding that stuff? Well, maybe they're actually doing a service to the community. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it like I don't I'll teach somebody stick for sure, but I'll wait until I know them as a person a little bit more and, and know their character before I put a knife in their hand. Right. But everybody wants to learn knife. Right. It's it becomes a super fun thing. It looks super yep, flashy, yep. but you know, there's there's an obligation that we have as there teachers is, as well. Yep. Yep. And You've I got think the moral, moral and ethical yep, issues, issues as obligation, obligation as a teacher. As a teacher. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So so it was interesting because when we posted those videos online and went viral and I think by the end of it, we were like 30 plus million views and like it, it kind of blew my mind and I could immediately tell somebody was from the States because it was like, you know, somebody put you in a headlock, like a schoolyard headlock and buddy's like, I'd pull out my nine mil and I'd shoot <laughs> up his ass, right? <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. Like, you know, some guy put you in a headlock and you're about to murder him. <laughs> okay. Like if you're okay with that, that's up to you. But if you're not okay with it, then what are you going to do? And I think that's where um, everything changed for me because yeah. 
it's it was like okay you know uh actually uh obviously the legendary guru dana santo i think he said it best um when i went to one of his seminars he said it's really fun teaching military guys because with the military guys, you just teach them the, the stuff that you love, the stuff like this is how you kill somebody. This is how you finish them off. This is how you move on to the next person. This is the simplistic side. This is the martial side of martial yeah. arts. Mm. And then you go to police officers or sorry, let's go to civilians, right? And the civilians are like, yeah, I don't really care about yeah, that. You got, I, yeah. I want to flow, right? I want to learn two sticks. I want to post this shit on my Instagram. I want to get <laughs> Right. you know i want to make it look good like you know when we did karens around the world i was like wow, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 cool. there's a lot of things there um but he's like the hardest people to teach are the law enforcement officers he's like because they have to have a blend of both exactly. they have to know when to be able to have control but they exactly. also have yeah, to know yeah. when they need to step it up a little bit to prevent yeah. anything worse from happening so when, when I heard that, that really resonated with me because it made me look, a, look at myself a lot more and be like, man, what am I doing? What am mm. I teaching? Mm. Am I teaching more of the arts? Am I teaching more of the martial? Am I calling it something it isn't? And then yeah, I started yeah. having this kind of internal dialogue and this internal struggle of like, man, I don't know. I don't know what I'm teaching. So then I had to start pressure testing it. Mm. And I started, you know, just stripping away like, you know what? I ate too much damage there. Let's throw that away, right? Oh, let's try this technique. Ah, let's throw that away. Hey, that one worked pretty well. Okay, it worked for me. Now let's give it to a smaller student. Does it work for them? Okay, now mm -hmm. does it work against the larger versus smaller opponent? Yeah. Okay? And and that's the, the only thing that you're going to know is if you do it, right? And you test it. But um, there's a saying like, you know, fight as you train and train as you fight. I think it's bullshit <laughs> because if I trained as I fight, all of my students wouldn't come back the next day, mm. right? They would be injured. They would be hurt. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right? So people are like, oh, you know, like you could punch them in the face and they'd be knocked out. I'm like, have you ever been punched in the face? Cause you don't get knocked out. <laughs> I was like, it's, it's not that easy. Like you take a couple good punches before anything's done. So I think all you're really trying to do is buy time. Right. And in a self-defense situation, again, it's like, well, are you by yourself or are you with other people? Right. Yeah. Because yeah. now I have a five year old son, well, four and a half, like my rules of engagement changed completely. Exactly. Like, exactly. Completely. Mm. Right. And, and I don't think people think about that, nor do they really even teach it. I mean, there's some great people that teach it out there. I'll definitely give a shout out to Randy King. Randy King, he, he, he talks to real shit, right? He, probably doesn't make a lot of friends in the martial arts community <laughs> <laughs> that's but the only thing <laughs> right and that's it right and now there's a political side of things right so yeah. all over yeah actually you've you've brought out quite um a lot of um great points okay um especially when when you're trying to like get your 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 blend it into your system and trying to find out basically what are you really like teaching your your students mm -hmm. arts or basically the the combative side of it the, yeah. the martial side of it yeah and it's really important to find your it's it's like your 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 ethos as yeah. well when it comes to teaching hey yeah. guru brian what's going on sorry i'm late no Gotta worries man no worries two mile drive to the desert <laughs> <laughs> how's it going kevin very good very good good to finally see your face Oh yeah, uh, that's, that's not what Guru Tom says, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, um, I guess I guess caught a little bit of what, what you were saying about the uh, the self defense thing, and uh, I agree everything you said. Uh, what I heard anyway, um, like uh, Guru Dean always says, we have the ethical obligation. Like when your family's with you, do you eat grass? Exactly. Do you eat grass? Do you face the threat head on? And um, I know, mm -hmm. like when I teach like, self defense stuff to my students, it's like. I do that same thing like you say you know do you, are you by yourself are you with a group of people are you with your wife are you with your kids are you with you know mm. just the, every situation is different but yeah yeah, hey. yeah. well and i i think it comes down to like if we bring it you know more to like a ground fight right now is let's say i get to a dominant position like mount and everybody says you know it's time to start throwing bombs right i'm always reminded of this one story that happened in winnipeg canada 
I think it was actually on Canada Day, unfortunately. But there was a whole bunch of people that were meeting up. I, there was a scuffle that kind of took place. Buddy got taken down to the ground. He ended up reversing position. He got into mount and he started just throwing bombs on this guy. And the guy on the bottom, his friend came up from behind and slashed him in the back with a machete. Like uh. 60. Right? So it's like, so does your ego get in the own way? Right? Exactly. Like, are you pissed off? And I, mm. I think that's where, like, it's, it is very important that we still train the art side of things because that art side, I mean, in my 20s, I didn't believe in it, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was like, oh, yeah, you know, look at this special chi and look at all these things. And it's like, but they, they were saying so much more. They were talking about that internal spiritual kind of journey yeah. right? of like, are you okay with this? Are you okay with murdering somebody? If you're not okay with murdering somebody, then you have to be thinking about those things, mm. right? But can, can you get in an altercation and find balance? Yeah. You know, yeah. because there, there's some hard ass dudes I've met in my life and they're so calm when a fight's taking place. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's the guy that's barely been in fights, but thinks he can fight. So he's the loud guy that's just talking, talking, talking. Right. Yeah. And I think martial arts has helped me find that balance so much because yeah. without it, I would have never been able to look within myself and look for all the holes in my say personal or sorry, my, my physical game that now when I looked into my own personal life, I was like, I have the same holes. You know, like, like Wing Chun showed me right away, I have a shit ton of control issues, right? <laughs> so, and I, when I'm in my life now and in my personal life, because it was brought awareness or awareness was brought to me through my physical training, it then translated into my own world yeah. like, amazingly well. And it's like, okay, start letting go of control. Start allowing others to invite them into your world. Stop having so many trust issues. And mm -hmm. it, it's it's amazing. And I'm just so grateful for for all the great senseis and people I've had in my life that have helped open up that door for me. So Yeah. I, I, I've been in a few fights in Winnipeg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Winnipeg, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I used to be stationed in North Dakota in Minot. So I used to go up to Regina. I used to go up to, to Winnipeg and and Brandon. And yeah, I've been that was when I was younger and, and a, lot, a lot of bar fights over there. Um, That's true, yeah. And I see exactly what you're talking about. Like over there, it was like you get in one fight and like there's like four or five guys, their friends are jumping you. And 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 like I, I didn't obviously like I didn't best them every time. I got my ass kicked quite a few times mm -hmm. over there. Um, yeah. That's before I started really starting doing martial arts stuff. But uh, now that that helped me experience uh, like the real world stuff, like actually being in a fight. For sure. Um, of course, we're intoxicated, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, they're partially not you. There's some yeah, people. There's some. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got a. You probably can't see. I got a scar here. I got a bottle <laughs> smashed in my face. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was New Year's Eve, two thousand and one. That went over there. Yeah. Yeah, I got a big fight over there. But uh, yeah, that I think that real world experience, a lot of people that teach self-defense, like they're never in a real fight. They yeah. don't know exactly mm -hmm. like to get jumped. How does it get jumped? That, kicked on the yeah, ground. That's true. You know, when it's like, I, I'm not proud of it. I mean, I'm like, like bragging on here, but I mean, been quite a few fights, but um, yeah. it helps you get the experience of what not to do. Like, for sure. It's been so long, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I, I think that's why you're seeing martial arts, like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu just like, take off on this exponential rate right now where everybody wants to train it because you can literally go balls to the wall every class full out mm. fight and you see how you do right mm. but the thing is is like there's no punching right mm. so so you got to build a base so then you got to have a good enough base in bjj and now you start adding in punching so you'll get okay well now we're going to go and do mma fighting it's like well mma fighting still has rules though yeah, right? that's going to boundaries. Yeah, exactly. Right. So yeah. even an amateur fighter and a pro fighter in an MMA fight, when I was doing corner work, I was like, "There's rules that amateurs can't, or the positions that amateurs can't do that pro fighters can." So mm -hmm. why am I training this amateur fighter to be a pro when yeah. they're actually going to lose it? And again, that that's getting into those um, mm. your environment will dictate that. Yeah, right? it, it changes it quite a bit. So. Like I'm all for like train whatever style of martial art you want. Just don't call it something it isn't. Like if you that's say this true. technique that's works hundred percent of the time, that's bullshit. <laughs> yep. Yep. If you did, we would all train it. 
There would yeah. be no yeah. diversity at all in any yeah. other martial art because everyone's like, this works. Yeah, right? 100%. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. So, Okay, hold on. Uh, we do have some uh, comments here. Um, yeah, Dean Franco said, good point on most uh, non-incorporating training when loved ones are present. Yeah. When when yeah when when you've got like your loved ones with you your your um uh, your sort of like your protocol your tactics your strategy changes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey well, Finder, are you are you training your family as well? Right, like that's does your true. family yep. know to that's, grab the kids and get point. back to the locked car? Mm -hmm. Right, and then you take care of business. You have to create some sports. Right? Yeah. And then hopefully your wife jumps in the driver's seat and runs them all over. <laughs> yeah. Your wife fights with you. Yeah, yeah. 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 That'd be pretty bye, bad. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so Jeff Jeffrey Finder here uh asked a question. When does combative become art? Picasso said to learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Ooh. That's that's a great question. Um, I think it. I go back to the military principle of kiss of keep it simple. So the way that I categorize things, say for striking, right, is compared to saying hook punch or overhand punch or cross or jab. I look at those as linear versus circular. Then you do the same thing with kicks: circular versus linear. So. Now you're starting to understand that combat can look like a lot of different things. How many tools do you have to deal with all of those? And that's the hard part because with how many years of training I have in many different styles of martial arts, I've been given tons of information. I like to think of it like Batman's utility belt. Oh, I okay. used have a utility belt that had 300 tools on it. And I would have to categorize in my mind of like, okay, circular attack coming to the upper body. What do I do? Do I do karate? Do I do karate? Do I do taekwondo? Do I do boxing? Right? Like, so I'm going through each one and I'm like, man, like, I don't know where that is, but that's the art side of it. So combatively, I wear one belt that has say 10 options, mm -hmm. but in the art world, if I'm feeling like I'm teaching in an artsy mood that night, I'll be like, okay, guys, against this circular attack, we're going to use karate. Now against this circular attack, we're going to use boxing. And then we're going to do stress testing at the end of the night and show me which one came out naturally. If you got punched in the face, you suck. You need to practice. <laughs> if you, you kind of blocked it, but you still hit yourself, well, at least you didn't take a full hit to the head, right? Um, then it's also like, what about the size of the attacker? If the attacker is much bigger, there's certain techniques that aren't going to yeah, work. But with, with that being said, like that's where Wing Chun did change my mind a little bit because it taught me more about skeletal structure than muscular structure. So I can now like, even with my kids, right. Is when they become an orange belt in my system, I throw just a big haymaker at them and I literally like at first their block is weak enough that they punch themselves in the face. And I'm like, okay, you got punched in the face. Don't punch yourself in the face. That's not my fault. That's yours. And they're like, what do you mean? You tried to punch me. I'm like, your block was too weak. Make your block stronger. Mm -hmm. So then, okay. So now their block is stronger, but because my fourth, because of my mass is so much stronger. Now, when I hit them, if they fly back four feet, but they didn't punch themselves and they mm -hmm. were able to block it, they use their bones against me. They use their whole body against me. They didn't just use one piece of their body. So I think there's that fine line of like, well, yeah, what yeah. is your job to that student right now? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to make them just hundred percent prepared for self-defense yeah. or are you trying to make them just learn about their body and proprioception? Because that's, that's the benefit of, of martial arts training, especially yeah. for kids. For adults, you'll usually know right away, right? Of like, okay, we're here to learn because I got my ass kicked and I don't want it to get kicked again. Cool, sweet. So we're gonna focus more on self-defense for you, but that's where I think you need to know your student base and you need to yeah. know your population because they're gonna tell you what they want. 
And when you listen to them as a teacher, that's your job, mm-hmm. right? It, it's it's not your job to say, well, this is what works for me, because yep, it's exactly that way, right? I think I think what you said was uh, I agree with that. Like for me, if you have something that you know absolutely works every time for that one situation, that's what I always like your go to, your go to move, a block, mm. a parry, a lock, wrist yep. lock, you know, arm lock, Kimura, whatever, arm bar, whatever. That's something like uh, people like there's so many techniques, like you said, from so many different martial arts, especially like for me, like the different systems I've been in. I take only a couple of my know that I think are going to work. I just keep practicing them over and over and over again. I'm not gonna like, maybe I think a little different. Like I don't think like if I'm gonna do like C lots move or Kali move or you know or Muay Thai as I start on the Muay Thai, you know, or, or or even the Piper stuff. I guess kind of like I take one thing. Like, I know it's gonna work. Like this lock, I know is gonna work because yeah. you know I've tried it several times under under stress. And because mm. I, yeah, I think if I think too much, like you said, if, if you think like all the different movements. A lot of people yeah. get overwhelmed, like you, especially under stress. They're like, you know, what do I do? Am I supposed to parry? Am I supposed to dive entry? You know, am I supposed to, you know, block or going with an elbow? You know, whatever. It's just so I see what you're saying about that. Like, because I think about that all the time too in my head. And you probably gonna think I'm weird. I'm gonna say this. I'm, you're probably gonna be like, this guy's a weirdo. Um, if I go in, a, if I go in a store, if I go in a store, and like, and I see somebody like a. Or like something they're checking me out and they can make a dirty look or whatever. Or I'm always in like on the edge for like you never know when something's gonna happen. And I always cycle in my head, kind of what you said. What move am I gonna do? This guy like is in a <laughs> line right now, and he's yeah, like, you know, yeah. I'm like cycling in my head, and and, and uh, wife is always like, what, what are you thinking like that for? I was like, well, I just I don't know what it is, but I'm like you. I'll assess the person and like, yeah. If this guy was to come at me right now, would that move work if I? It's weird, out like <laughs> yeah. it's just random. The guy's not even a threat, but I'm still thinking about it. Like, nice. Yeah, it's, it's a nice away. mental like, game. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a like, nice mental exercise. You know, because I've been in a store a couple of times. I can see some big. They got some big dudes around here where I live. A lot of them are like Native American and like kind of the big, big dudes, and they always check you out. They always got a big old knife on the side. And they're like, they was checking you up and down. I'm like, if this guy was to come at me right now, <laughs> would that flower entry, would that flower block work? Would that dive entry? Like, I don't know. Yeah, off yeah. topic, random shit. But no, 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 man. Because <laughs> like that's. <laughs> That's the way of the martial artist, right? But but does it make me kind of like a narcissist? Like, a, like does it make me think like, a, am I ego driven if I oh. think that? Like, this guy's checking me out. Like, what move am I gonna do? Take him out in case he comes at me. Like, I, I don't, don't want to be that kind of guy, you know. But it's like it just comes out. I don't know. Like mentally, well, it comes out. Who knows, man? Maybe they're just checking out your ass. Right? Yeah, <laughs> could be. I, I got a pretty sweet ass, man. So that's what I've been told. <laughs> right. But, but no, like I, I hear you say, like I still walk into the restaurant and I want my back to the wall. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you know, but but that's because my job when I'm with people that I care about and yeah. love is to protect her. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Exactly. But that's like true. psychologically speaking, yes, there's a condition for that. <laughs> right. I, I wouldn't call him a narcissist, right? But it's like, <laughs> I need to get some help and shit. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's or... because like I spent. Oh, my teens and all my 20s and it, I was so paranoid and, it, and that's why I try and talk with my my students a lot especially because self-defense and everything can be prevented if you look at it right and based on my belief system is I believe I'm the cause of all of my own suffering all of it mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so I take accountability for everything never once will I be the victim because I choose not to be the victim mm-hmm. so if I'm walking into a situation, I feel very prepared for that situation, then I've done my due diligence. Mm-hmm. But yeah. there's some people that don't want to live that way. There's also a lot of people that have never been in a fight, like you said, or have never heard mm-hmm. the war stories that we've heard, mm-hmm. right? Because there's some shitty fucking people in this world. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. When, when there's a lot of those shitty people and we've met those people or they're our friends, right? <laughs> or, right, like yeah. there's there's this balance of like, okay, well, where am I going to live? And it's like, there's a fine yeah. line. Like, am I being paranoid or am I being situationally aware? Mm-hmm. Right. And I used to like, I used to dream about martial arts. I used to dream about fighting. I mean, ask my ex, like I would backfist her in the middle of the night. Right. And all this, right. And it was, and it was, it was bad. And I was, I was always fighting and doing something. And then, I found some calmness within my being. And I think I found that calmness 
when I found the confidence within myself that mm -hmm. I believed and I trusted in what I was doing now. Mm -hmm. Because for so long, I was being told from so many people, yeah. it was like, this will work, this will work, this will work, this will work. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's going to work. So because I don't know what's going to work, I'm going to have to explore, 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 explore. So it's like yes. 40,000 hours of training later, I'm like, oh, well, now I know what works, right? <laughs> and now I know what works. It's like, okay, well, now is it my job to share that to other people? And do people even want to listen to it, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's where you'll find out or not. I mean, some people train martial arts because they like fitness. Some people train mm -hmm. martial arts because they want self-defense. Some people mm -hmm. train martial arts because they want community. Well, what if as a business owner, you could do all three of those and encompass it? Because think of all the amazing friends and connections and especially what you guys do such a great job promoting FMA. Look, look how many people have come together. Like mm -hmm. that's the community. That's something that, that you can never take away. It's a brotherhood. It's very similar to the military of like, yeah. we've been through shit. We want to continue to be through shit. Like, I mean, when you sweat and bleed over top of each other and you're laughing and smiling about it, like that's a cool thing. Yeah. Again, it's psychological issue, but it's mm -hmm. still a cool thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's that's what's super important for me is it like can I create that community? Yeah. as much as I can. And if these like-minded indiv individuals are coming together, well, we're, we're all a little crazy. Mm. I think we admit it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, sorry. We've got a uh, comment here. Uh, Sipa God, here, here to watch the second handsomest man in filipino martial arts wait gm bobby is the handsomest that makes you the third <laughs> oh too funny that's got to be uh guru joel eh? yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. yeah. Of course. joel and car yeah. okay so, adin well. has a question here how do you how do you incorporate stress inoculation to your adult students without initially overwhelming them sometimes you can't um you, you not overwhelm them i mean my goal is um and i'm going to bring into the kids program here because they're still innocent okay and they most of them haven't really pushed themselves that hard i get a lot of compliments of from parents after tests with the kids when i spar them of listen i've never seen my kid have their eyes and have their anxiety and they're watering up so much and they're they're almost at the brink of crying and you're creating pain in them you're creating anxiety you're creating mm. stress you're doing all these things and when i see their body react and i and i know people right but you're gonna see their body language so when i was in hong kong like we would beat each other non-stop but we never spoke the same language right so how are we communicating we're using body language so i think it, the goal of the instructor is consistently be pushing their students to their maximum limit if you push them past that moment you fucked up somewhere as a teacher because yeah. like you're gonna see it right and i know that because earlier in my teaching years i push them and they're like yeah okay i want to be pushed i push them and i was like oh they said they want to be pushed i'm 20 i'm young i'll push you and then i push them too far and then they didn't come back and i'm like okay uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Looking for business right so it's like okay so i gotta find that limit how yeah. far can i push them right yeah. and it's like find a balance exactly so so i think jujitsu is a, a great point for that is when say i have a fairly new student in jits and i'm squishing them and I'm 240 and I'm on top of them and they're not breathing and they're not doing anything and they're kind of freaking out and I can feel their body tense up and I can see or feel all of their body is just, it's not, they're not normal. They're not okay. But where are they within that spectrum of not okay? Mm. Are they at a point now where they're still coachable? So I'm consistently checking in with them. Hey, breathe. Oh, you're listening. Okay, good. Okay, breathe more. Continue your breathing. Find your center. It's okay. You're just getting squished. You're not going to die. I'm not going to let you die. You're not in threat. You're in a safe place. So I'm kind of comforting them into that point that they get used to being okay in that moment. Mm -hmm. So then the next time that I get there, now all of a sudden, we've pushed it a little further. 
So now I can take them a little further and push them and take them a little further. I think communication is so important there. If you speak the same language, you have to be communicating with your student. How's that good, bad? I also have some students who are like, yeah, this is terrible. I don't want to do this. Stop. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I'm like, not right now. I'm like, if you're able to formulate that sentence, you are not being pushed hard enough. So push yeah. yourself harder. You're choosing to give up right now. Don't give up. Because if this is a fight, would you give up? And sometimes you got to know that student to also like to, to start probing in their mind a little bit, right? Like mm. I had taught one of my um, students' kids years ago. And I said, would you let your son let you stop right now? What if your son was being attacked over there in the corner and the other attacker is on top of you? Fight right now like you need to go and save his life. And now yeah. all of a sudden he was at his brink. He's way back down to 50% and he finds 50% more. And I was like, at the end of it, now we stop and we debrief. And we're like, mm -hmm. okay, how was that? Were you pushed hard? Yeah, oh, holy shit, that was like so close to the edge perfect right or hey you know i felt like that was a little bit too much well good all we're doing is, is we're instilling communication and when yeah. we have communication now we're actually creating um relationships yeah. and bonds that will be there forever right when guru joel and i go at it in balance walk like no rules just play go right um we beat the shit out of each other, right? But every <laughs> now and then, because we'll use sticks, right? He'll like crack me in the head, I'll crack him in. He's like, ooh, ooh, there's a big bump. I'm like, it's okay, you know me, come on, let's go. And he's like, yeah, this is awesome, right? We push each other super hard and it's it's fun, but you can't do that with everybody. Yeah, that's true. So the only way that you're gonna know to, to kind of roundabout come back to the question is like, you gotta know your student base. Mm. Do they trust you enough or are they comfortable with you enough to be able to have those conversations. Like, there's been some really hard conversations too, right? Yeah. Where they're like, hey, listen, like, I'm going through some shit right now. I can't get pushed today. That's amazing. That person knows they're being then. Like that's, that's amazing emotional intelligence, right? And then you have the other student that had, you know, they, they've never had communication skills and they're coming into class and they look all pissed off and you're like, oh, here we go. Make sure not to push them today, right? Because you're reading already that they're pissed off. Mm. But I mean, you, you got to know your student base, or at least you got to be good at reading it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Jeffrey has a has a comment here. If something works, wouldn't everyone do it? Isn't the most common statement in FMA? We have that too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But I, sure. I think like we we like that's that's proven numerous times. And this is kind of what I want to get into a little bit later of like it's the first moment or the first reaction that I believe we all build, which is almost identical. Is everybody's response to an angle eight the same? Mm. Right. Because if you look at a lot of different styles of Filipino martial arts, a lot of people do the same thing. So when I study a whole bunch of different styles of Filipino martial arts, the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same thing that's taught in all of them. And I'm going to choose to teach that one for its self-defense aspect because that works. And numerous people say it works. Mm -hmm. If somebody says it doesn't work, I want to know why. And yeah. I think when i wasn't confident as a teacher i hated why or what if mm. now i encourage it so much because i've heard the ten thousand plus versions of it so every now and then when i hear a new one like i haven't heard that before or i haven't thought of that cool I'm, I'm not egotistical i'll actually stop and be like do you know what i don't have the answer for that i'm actually going to contact guys in the forum and say, hey guys, what would you do with this? And there's some phenomenal forums that for fighting these days. They can be like, hey guys, what is your response with this? Show me what style of martial art you train and how you would deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. Because then we're just, we're all helping each other do it. Um, I mean, if they all have it, train it. If they mm -hmm. all don't have it, it's probably because it's low percentage. Yeah. Right? Again, true. the BJJ community like reiterates this so hard of, do you want to teach your students 
high percentage moves or low percentage moves. That's what it comes down to, mm -hmm. right? Because if you want to build very good self-defense or just defense in general in BJJ, you're going to be teaching high percentage stuff that works for every body type. But yeah. if you're going to be teaching low percentage stuff, like a crazy flying arm bar, right? Well, my 60 year old student isn't going to want to do a flying arm. Mm. Right? Super, or, Superman punch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a great point you actually raised there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I would miss the first part of the interview, but I want to. I want to kind of get into that whole uh, how you got started with the uh, with that video, that series that you had coming out with self defense and the Bud and the Budo brothers. Yeah, I kind of yeah. kind of want to jump into that because that's what really piqued my interest when I first started seeing your your uh, the video series you had. And uh, yeah, I, I might want to take that too because I mean, I know some people are like, "Well, I don't need that. I got self defense stuff ready." But like, I saw it and I really liked it. That's why I wanted to interview. I was like, "Man, I start like." I was, I was cyber stalking kind of, I was like looking at all that <laughs> shit and I'm like, I like, mean, this is a badass shit this guy has, you know, it's like, you know, I'm like, well, check it out, you know, I want to, I want to kind of interview him and get into this whole thing. And I was like, I'm going to, you know, I might pull the trigger when I got time to go over your course. Um, but yeah. I want to get, I want to get how you got involved in that, how that all started and, and how you so, asked. And I mean, a couple, a couple of years ago, um, the Budo brothers guys see me doing some blint walk in Wing Chun. And they're like, yo, this guy's fast. Like, you know, it's, it's showy. It's flashy. It looks cool. Let's go film some of that and see what we can do. Um, so they came in. They filmed a little bit of it. I had, like, literally three months just started my own dojo. So I was like, sweet. This is what I've been waiting for. Yeah. It bombed. It bombed so bad. <laughs> like, at the time, it was maybe, like, 5,000 likes, like, if that, right? Or some 5,000 views. Um, I watched... A lot of the Buddha Brothers stuff after that, we kind of stayed in contact, nothing too crazy. I really appreciated what they were doing for the martial arts community. Um, and then when I got to know them better, both Kyle and Eric, um, they're really good dudes. They're really good dudes. And they're all about just helping to spread martial arts, but to help kids even with their Udo booth run, like being able to train martial arts for people that couldn't afford it. I mean, that was me growing up. If my mom didn't know my sensei, I would have never got into martial arts. Yeah. Right. So it, it was, it was a, it was a moment that I was like, okay, you know, these guys are more than just trying to make some bank, right. Mm -hmm. They, they want to put out some stuff. So, um, Kyle and Eric, they had, uh, started doing some private lessons with me and they're like, you know, like, we really like what you do, man. It's different. Right. You have a, a very interesting outlook on things, right? The way that you deal with things, you look at it more of a conceptual level versus a technique. So, and that goes back to the circular versus linear strike thing, right? Um, I don't like to overcomplicate things. So when I started teaching them, they're like, yo man, like I haven't seen this. We've been all over North America, all over the world. And we haven't really seen anything like this. Like you take the good BJJ stuff, the high percentage stuff, but then you get away after, like you get to a dominant position and you get back to your feet as quick as you can. You inflict some damage, but like a lot of people don't do that. Why do you do that? And at the time I was like, well, it's self-defense. Yeah. Like, I don't know what's behind me anymore. If I happen to be in guard, like say I got like cold clock, some guy like double leg me down to the ground. I'm on the ground. I'm starting to eat shots. I kind of all dazed, all messed up. I come to my training kicks in. I'm in a really hard guard fight. I'm taking damage. I'm worried about weapons. I'm worried about other people. I get to a dominant position. Now in that dominant position, I exit so I can reassess my whole situation. Um, that I haven't seen that really being taught anywhere, to be honest. Right? I see good BJJ being taught. I see good striking being taught. I see good for, you know, martial arts being taught, but are they teaching people the self-defense thing? And we didn't really see anybody doing that. Mm. So we said, okay, like maybe there's a market here that we can tap into because everybody calls their shit self-defense. Everybody. Mm. I mean, I grew up in my sense was like, yeah, this is good self-defense. And now I look at it, I'm like, well, 
I, I knew how to kick, but I also live in Canada and we have snow six months of the year and I don't kick a lot anymore if I'm training self-defense. If I'm sparring, I kick all the time. But if I'm training my self-defense stuff, I'm rarely kicking. Um, so then it's like, okay, can I keep my feet planted on the ground and can I develop good hands? Well, who has the best hands in the world? I think boxers. Boxers, yeah. Right? Oh, who yeah. has the best trapping in the world? Wing Chun. But like Wing Chun gets clowned all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, that shit won't work. That shit won't work. You're right. It yeah. won't. If you think it's going to work, <laughs> right? Like it's training your body to do something, right? So like an accepting Tan Sao that rotates your body, you're mm. not thinking of that. You've trained yourself enough that when you go to backfist somebody in the face and their pressure pushes it in, you're just absorbing it and then a, maybe a it ton is, yeah. of hit comes out or something. Like That's where your training has to kind of take over. But again, the Wing Chun community gets a bad rep because they're trying to show that a traditional martial art works. But it works in the context in that fight. When you have those five mm. ranges that we talked mm. about, like trapping is is a split second. A yeah. split second. The way I like to think of uh, the Wing Chun world is like with good trapping, you'll hit them once. Mm -hmm. And then how they fall mm. after, if they fall, is going to determine what you do next. Say if I punch some guy and he falls like half a step. Well, now he's in boxing range. Throw a boxing punch. Right or karate punch, whatever kind of punch mm. you want to call throw mm. punch. Right, if he falls back far enough that you can't punch him with a kick, okay, well, great. If he falls fall enough, you can continue to try to kick, or you can just leave. Like there's there's so many things that come into play, and um, I don't know why we did so well online. I don't know why we went so viral. To be honest, I mean, Kyle's a killer at marketing, and Eric's so good at it, but. I don't know if it was that. I think it was, to be honest, the controversy. If you notice, I worked with Eric a lot, and Eric is like a foot shorter than me. Yeah, I saw, I saw a lot of people hating and shit. And I thought, like, oh, 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 he's smaller than he is. Yeah, like, well, yeah. Do you think everything needs to be fucking equal? Like when you go in a real fight? Yeah. Like, come on, like, <laughs> right? Small right? So they're like, can't fight him. Like, yeah, come on. yeah. Yeah, but because I was the teacher and because I was being efficient and I was showing the technique, yeah. mm. because I'm the bigger guy doing it, everyone's like, oh, that yeah. shit won't work. And it's like, well, at least we're getting likes. At least we're getting comments. At least it's tapping into the algorithms of Instagram yeah. and Facebook and causing controversy and everybody wants to talk about it now. So it's, it's going to be spread to everywhere, right? Um, yeah. my, my girlfriend would say otherwise. She's like, it's because you're cute. And he kind of <laughs> looks like a mini four, and you guys are fit, and you're a good teacher, and you're teaching good stuff. And I'm like, okay, thanks, babe. But anyways, right? Um, <laughs> like, there's there's all those kind of interesting details about the internet of like how much is there. I mean, mm -hmm. at the start of COVID, every BJJ club offered all of their instructionals for free almost, right? So everybody almost hit this leg in this last year and a half of like. Mm -hmm. It sucks. I don't want to do any more online stuff. I want to get back to training in person. I want to be doing all these things. So why it went viral, I don't know. Um, I think, especially with the weapon stuff, if mm -hmm. anybody, anybody puts out a knife video, you are going to get hound. Oh, if yeah, you, definitely. If you don't have thick skin, you can't make it online, mm. right? Because People are being like, that's bullshit. You're teaching people how to get murdered. You're good to make you yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? And you're yeah. like, wow. Like, you know, people feel that way. But, you know, when you ask them online, it's like, you know, what kind of training do you have? They're like, nothing. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Like, how do you know that then? They're like, because I can tell. Well, my, 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 my instructor said that's not going to work. He watched it. He said it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah, it's like the whole, all this shit in there. Everybody says in there. I, I saw, I guess, briefly, like the little... Like I was just trying to like I was being a cheap motherfucker. I was just like watching the uh, the little clips you're doing. I'm like, man, I gotta try to replicate some of that stuff in there. But yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy the course though eventually. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't trying to rip your shit off, right? I was like, oh, yeah. oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. I was like, man, like, <laughs> no, I was saying like, 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 like being cheap and just watching the clips and like you know trying to be one of those YouTube guys. I saw it on YouTube. Uh, I have a student that did that. He's like, well, I'm seeing this on YouTube and. 
this is the way the guy did it. And uh, you're doing it completely wrong, but that's like a whole other yeah. story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah I, I seen the video and I really want to like promote it like here on here. Like I think people should get it. Um, I've seen Thank like just, just excerpts of it, but I'm um, just what I've seen. Like, it's like awesome stuff. It's like all practical and, and realistic scenarios. Like the way you explain it, break it down. Like the headlock one you were showing, like this way you don't want to be, you know, like worst case scenario, this, you give the different scenarios. And like, that's why I liked yeah. about it. Like attracted me to it. Like, ah, oh, I mean, he's give me like options and stuff like, you know, I can do. Um, well, and that's it, right? Because <clears> every, yeah. everybody's going to have their own cup of tea, right? Yeah. So yeah. Like, for me, is it's like, I actually don't teach a lot of takedowns because yeah. takedowns are hard on the body and because I don't train a lot of police officers. All my police officers, we do lots of takedowns. Yeah. But yeah. the ones that aren't, I'm like, why are you taking somebody down? Let's say that for a moment they have better wrestling than you or better judo or better BJJ. And mm -hmm. you happen to get lucky enough that you took them down to the ground. And now they're down on the ground and all they have to do, this is what they taught us in the military, no word of lie, hug. Mm -hmm. Hug tight. So if you're in being mounted, hug tight. They can't punch you. If you're in guard, hug tight with your legs, hug tight with your arms. They can't do anything. Now they can't access a weapon. But you always have your partner or your fire team partner beside you to help you out. So it's, again, their environment dictates what yeah. they're going to do. That's true. So in Canadian law, though, like you have to know what are you allowed to do. Right. If you're in a situation, say uh, uh, Eric in the video, short guy versus tall guy, and everybody's videotaping us and I attack Eric first, who gets charged? Not you are, of course. Mm. Probably me. But what if I had video as well and Eric said to me, he's going to murder me with the knife he has in his pocket? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if you don't have a good lawyer, you can't back that up. Mm. So if you can't back that up, like, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. And like, and that's the thing is it's, that's why I always go worst case, best case. Right. So I believe if I'm going to do service to my students, they need to know worst case first. Exactly. They need to know how to get out of the worst case mm -hmm. so that they can eventually get back to a best case scenario. Yeah. Like if, you, if somebody's threatening you and you feel like you're entitled to throw a punch legally speaking and you smash a jab and you knock them out or at least stumble them back, but then they trip over a curb and they yeah. fall back their head and they die. Are you okay with attacking first? Mm. Yeah. And, and that changes a lot of things because people don't think about that. They're like, oh, that would yeah, never yeah. happen. Well, that yeah. one in a million person I've met numerous mm. times in my life. Yeah. And it's like, so those stories have influenced me tremendously mm. because it mm. changes everything. Like I remember one time um, when I was working in the police force, uh, one of the police officers said, yeah, man, I shot a dude right in the forehead. He's like with my uh, nine mil. And he shot, hit him right in the forehead, entered the skin, wrapped around the skull and exited out the rear. And Buddy still kept coming forward. He didn't know until he had actually got him arrested with his partner that he had a bullet wrap around his whole head. He's like, I swear I hit him in the head. And he had no idea. So you're like, okay, you know, buy a bigger gun. <laughs> right? yeah. But it's like, like, what do you do in that situation? Are you prepared for that worst case? Like, everybody yeah. watches movies, and it's like, you know, um, subject gets shot, and it's like, and they fire away, right? And it's like, no, like, bullets don't have the stopping power. But I only know that because I spent a lot of time with fire. Right? If, if you haven't spent time with it, then you don't know. And if you, you don't, don't know, know yes. then, especially in Canada, like nobody here open carries. Nobody, well, we're not even allowed to carry a no, pistol. We, we, we don't carry here in New Mexico, yeah. and I have a concealed too, so everybody's yeah. packing everybody's pack here in town. Everybody. Women, now, men, teenagers. Yeah. So be very foolish to try to mess with somebody around here and get shot. So, <laughs> right? like, and yeah. that's, that's a weird world for me. Like, yeah. That's the exact opposite, right? Where I yeah. like I carry a utility tool on me, my everyday carry, because that's the closest thing to a weapon I'm comfortable with. When I was yeah. doing executive protection, I wasn't allowed to carry a knife, right? So I had to carry a Smith & Western pen. And because I was really good at throwing weapons, I had to get good enough that I could stick it into an eyeball in case the uh, <laughs> 
happened to have a gun that I at least had a long distance weapon to deal with it. Right. It was the closest thing to uh, like a prison chank you could get, but that was yeah. the only thing that they were okay with me carrying. Right. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's all so different where you are, right? Like if everybody had an open carry, I don't think my Canadian system would do well, but my American system would do awesome because it's mostly fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And right? a, lot of the, a lot of the courses you see in my area are tactical firearm shooting courses. There's very mm -hmm. few self-defense courses there. I've taught a couple here, sure. like people here, but most of it's go to the gun. Like you gotta go to the range, you gotta whatever, you know, that's what people are comfortable here with. Yeah. Carrying, carrying a gun. And so, I mean, they should be if they are worried about preservation of life, their own yeah, life, right? That's true. Because it like, it, we're back to that paranoid, like how paranoid are you? Yeah. You know, are you paranoid enough to get yeah. away? Yeah. Well, I, I encourage you to go look at New Mexico's murder stats, murder stats and, then you, <laughs> and then you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Hey. There is always a lot of stabbings here. We're close, I am close to the border. Of El Paso. I'm close to El Paso. I'm 35 minutes away, which is close okay. to Juarez, which is a lot of cartels. I okay, mean, yeah. They're always killing border patrol guards here, cops here. They find wow. them out in the desert, missing their fingers, missing their tongues, missing their head. So oh. there's, there's a lot of people around here because it's close to the border. Yeah. So there's a lot of violence around here. Yeah. So a firearm is pretty much the go to for a lot of people around here. Yeah. We have the same issue with moose. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's a completely different world right and i yeah. think that's the thing is it's you know for me if we let go of all the different styles of martial arts what are we really learning about ourselves right is it's our ability to master ourselves yeah right? that's a great um, point yes. you know in, in the physiotherapy world it's proprioception do you know where your hand is in space Mm. right you know how it got to that space mm. right and if you understand that about your body like you're just you're learning to master it. whether you yeah. do that through yoga whether you do that through shooting whether you do that through anything it's really up to you i mean that was one of the main reasons why i called myself the gong fu academy because gong fu is in relation to mastery of you and yourself yeah. kung yeah. fu is in relation to always a martial art but Gong Fu was more important to me because like the kids program, it takes so long for them to build up. But once they earn a junior black belt in the system, now they come to the adult program, they get an automatic blue belt, right? Now they're actually being introduced to, hey, this is true pressure now. Hey, this is some guard fighting. Hey, a knife is coming out. Hey, a stick is coming out. Hey, there's a gun. What do you do with all this now? And I believe it's very important to teach people to walk before they run. Because if Maybe you don't, yeah, that's, well, true. that's very true. Right? Like I'm, imagine if every FMA club was like Dog Brothers in the 80s. There there yeah. would be none of us. There would be none of us. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. cripples. The thing, is, <laughs> the thing is, too, when you get like a lot of students, they, right away it's like, where's the knife at? Where, I saw where's the knife? Kyler knife right now? Uh, Kyler Bolo? Like, no, you got to start out doing this, you know, baby steps first. You'll get there eventually. But everybody yeah. has that. They want to get right to the end, the finish line without even getting off the starting line. And they, yeah. they see movies or they hear, oh, I saw this in this movie. And I want to do what they did in the movie. Can you start showing me a knife now? I'm like, no, no, no. You got to wait. You yeah. know? And you might, lose some, you might lose some students. I've lost a few that, you know, that they were disappointed because they didn't want to learn knife the first day. Like, I want to start learning how to handle knife and karambe it and it's like no it's not it doesn't work that way some teachers they do that i've seen some teachers some people i know that they teach knife like right away and i don't yeah. know why but i mean it's their system but whatever but well yeah, and, and i think it, it depends too right like yeah. i we, yeah. we were talking about that earlier and it was like i don't knife right away but i also had a friend contact me and he's like listen man i got in a road raid in incident i was like first you started or them He's like them. I was like, did you continue to instigate it? He's like, no. I was like, okay, good. Right. Cause I, if he started, I would have never continued the conversation because he's an asshole. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He needs to get his ass kicked so that he stops picking the lesson. lesson. Exactly. Yeah. But then he goes and he's like, the guy pinned me up against, he put his hand down by his pocket and he's like, I thought I was going to get shanked and die. Right. So in that moment I showed him knife defense. 
I didn't yeah, show yeah. any attacks, yeah, but I showed him yeah. some basic yeah. knife stuff. And so he felt a little bit more confident in himself. So like for every rule, there's also a guideline. And that's why like, I don't like anything hard and fast because like none of it works a hundred percent of the time. Right. Yeah. And that's where, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, they look at some of my stuff online and they're like, Hey man, like, I think that's really good. We trained something very similar. I'm like, cool, show me your variation, please. Right. And they're like, what? Like not a lot of people ask for that stuff mm -hmm. because everybody kind of puts themselves on this hierarchy of like, Oh, I'm the teacher. Everybody must learn from me. And it's like, I'm mm -hmm. always the white belt, no matter who I am or where mm -hmm. I am within my life. Cause I'm always learning from somebody. Yeah. The people that have taught me my best lessons are my students mm -hmm. and not the good ones. The bad yeah. ones know what to do or it feels weird or it feels awkward because they're going to be the majority of the population i mean if you've ever stick sparred somebody who's brand new it's almost harder than sparring your guru <laughs> right? mm -hmm. so 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 yeah yeah awkward yeah right and, and i mean yeah they don't have that structure, so they're just all the while striking, like they're not knowing, like you know, angle one, two. They're just kind of like oh, da, 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 everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Joel has a question here. Do you think that uh, confidence and feeling of security is one of the most common, uh, important gifts? Uh, most important gift of training martial arts. I I think it would depend on what the student's goals are. To be perfectly honest, I think the student that would say yes, confidence and feeling of security uh, is the student that's probably had some post-traumatic stress, that's either known somebody that's had something like that, or has just been through them, right? Or they just thought about it or tried to mentally prepare for that. Um, so yeah. for that student, yeah, most definitely, it's it's going to be one of the best things, but. I think we have to be also very careful on the word confident because overconfidence I see way too often in the martial arts world. Yeah. Right? Like true. I know guys that are like, yo, I can bang, man. Like I've been in street fights, I've been mar doing martial arts for years, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you know, let's go in the backyard and go play a little bit after a couple of beers. Right. And you take them down to the ground and they're like, oh, you know, you won because you're bigger. Or you won because you've trained them. <laughs> like, I still won. You know, like stop being so cocky, right? Yeah. And you get a chance to, to just try to learn more as much as you can and learn yeah. from everybody. Like everybody. Yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. Co totally agree with, with, with what you said. Okay. Um, I believe you got a demonstration. Prepared yeah. For well, I just wanted to, if, especially for the Filipino martial arts community, right um just kind of touch on some basics of just okay i'm i'm gonna lower myself and brian down okay yeah sounds space. great okay so i just want to... so if we just we'll, we'll just make it super simple okay right leg forward right hand so just our basic angles angle one angle two three four Five is a thrust, six horizontal, seven horizontal, eight down, nine up, and your base ab and equals, right? So at least we all have the same language. My biggest thing is what are you building in your students or what have you built in yourself against angle one? Because a lot of the times when we see angle one, right, is it's always the instructor stopping here at angle one and saying, hey, we've matched this. And now we can do all these super fancy techniques and go from there. Well, if you go into the PPCT world, the uh, law enforcement training, your number one strike or your forward fluid shock wave strike is your hardest strike. If this can come at over 140 miles an hour, are you going to be confident enough to step in on angle one? And I'm going to probably say no. So a lot of times we think about the fact that we can actually do something off an angle one when realistically speaking, I don't believe we can. So if the angle one comes, this is kind of where we build the idea of our timing and our range. So if Alan's just setting up his base plot, step forward to the camera, okay? So I'm just gonna cut angle six and seven right now. So as I go to cut angle six, no, stay still, walk please. 
So here, see how he gets hit? I do this at the start of every one of my Filipino martial art lessons, no matter how much training they have, and I guaranteed hit them every single time. Because of their habits, please, is what ends up happening is they play this game. They play this, oh, I'm going to hit your stick game. When I swing a stick at somebody, I swing it at them. I don't care where their stick is, I'm still trying to hit them. So if he happened to read that I was firing an angle six and this hit, well, my pressure is still going to go through and hit him. If I'm going for the head, that could mean that his head is possibly getting hit. So we have to start understanding about our shoulder lines and our center line as much as we can. A lot of people, when they do a block to their left from here, they're like, yes, I'm blocking it. But do they go too far past where the shoulder line was? So a simple drill like that can just give your students an idea or an understanding, okay, where should their block be? So again, if I see that, hopefully he does right this time, is I'm here, see he's still hit. And all I'm doing with my stick to guarantee this is I'm putting proper pressure in my pinky and pushing into him. Notice the difference now as I turn is now he's connected to me. So now if I cut through, it turns. So even if I go faster, stay, is he's found that proper angle now that even though I'm still trying to cut him, I'm even trying to push to show it that he's not getting hit now. So just knowing where your basic blocks should be on both sides will make a massive difference in the student's training. So this is where I really like the blimp walk block for their angle one. Okay, so when it's coming down onto this side, is they punch up. And they want it kind of the same idea here, punching out, they're punching forward. And I think it's a beautiful counter to the angle one. It takes all the same principles of an angle one versus angle one, creating that perpendicular angle. Now we're talking about structure, now we're doing everything right. But compared to thinking of it as a strike, we tend to always see ones and twos and ones and twos all the time, attack versus attack. Well, where's the defense, right? We need to have some defense. Self-defense is about defending yourself, guaranteeing that you won't get hit. So if you're able to trust your defense, you should be able to take it to the next level and then create some offense. So again, on that angle one, when I fire, Alan's going to block just by punching up. It's the same thing that we're talking about. But what I want the uke or the person attacking to always focus on is actually swinging a stick at them. We tend to see a lot of just stopping strikes like this, especially in demonstrations. But realistically speaking, if you Google machete fight, you never see a pulling back strike. It's very, very rare unless it worked the first time and then they just keep on going to it because they couldn't cut you through or they couldn't cut your head off, so they're gonna pull it back and continue to try and chop, kind of like a caveman mentality. So when I swing at my students, once I know that their block is good, now I cut through every time, every single time. I want it to be a strong strike so they know what it's like. Just like we were talking about before, if that student hits themselves in the face, well, your stick's gonna hit you. At least you're learning, and you're gonna create a stronger grip in doing so. So when I go to attack that, it's here. Now it's all dependent on my training. Notice how my training stopped with the pointy end pointed at him. When I do my basics, here one, I keep that pinky tight the whole time. I do not break my wrist. The reason why is because of my schooling background. The wrist goes like this, supination palm up, pronation palm down, aka abanico or fanning motion. Okay, there's only so much range of motion that we can do. Notice here is as I start going, the elbow joint's trying to save the wrist joint, the shoulder's trying to save that, and now it's affecting my spine. So everything changes dramatically when that happens. So when I'm going to cut through something, I was really embarrassed when I was actually uh, cutting through a dead pig once. I went to go cut through the dead pig and I would always do this with my stick. I would break my wrist to make that whipping sound and make it appear fast and cutting on that 45 degree angle and making it fast and it, it looks super cool. But when I went to go actually cut something and I broke the wrist, I actually turned the blade sideways. And when I went to go actually hit the pig, it turned sideways and I disarmed myself right away. So it was super embarrassing, but it was also an amazing moment for me because I said, listen, if I'm ever going to hit somebody, I have to make sure that my pinky is leading through this. 
Now, as the years went on and my training got stronger and I got stronger and my muscular structure could back up my skeletal structure, well, I can crack something and do this now without disarming myself. But you have to be able to get to that point first, and it takes a while. Somebody like Grandmaster Bobby Tabuata, like forearm just built so strong, crazy, crazy death grip on the stick. He can crack his stick whenever he wants because he has the strength to back it up. But if you haven't trained martial arts for 30 years, do you have the ability to make that happen? So when I go to cut, you'll notice I'll cut through on my angle one, and then I'll ab and eco for my chamber. I'll cut through, ab and eco. 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 Cut through, no ab and eco now. Right? But the whole idea of that is to build the proper body mechanics so that we understand what is it that we're doing. The reason why this is so important because this now comes into our timing. As I go to strike at Alan and he does that block, when I'm here, if I've turned this over this way, now I only have my puño to strike with him or an abanico or something that's not going to have a lot of power. But if I went through here and he came in step forward, now I have something to thrust back on him. So right away, that will determine if Alan moves in or not. The reason why I love Lin Tuak Wing Chun Jiu Jitsu is it forces you into a position to make somebody awkward. In Canada, we like having this much space in between people. We call it our bubble, right, where we have this three-foot space. You go three-foot space plus three-foot space, now you have your reactionary gap. This is what's going to keep you safe all the time. But you don't always get that. But you can force it with good footwork. And in the Filipino martial arts world, I see a lot of people that don't train their footwork a lot, right? What do I mean by that? This is typically how I see like a 10 count sombrata is we're going one, two, three, come back, right? He doesn't remember, don't worry, right? And it's really just clickety clack with the stick, right? Where there should be a lot more footwork taking place. When he comes, I'm here, I'm countering him, he goes to attack. I step back, I step in, he goes to hit, I'm doing my V step, I'm coming back down. Like, there should be so much footwork and training, especially in the self defense world. Because what if you don't have a stick and you've always got used to just using your stick to get the job done, but now there's no stick there and you don't have your footwork to back you up? It's a big pet peeve of mine and something I really, really want people to start thinking of. Don't worry about going fast. Go slow and do it right. Build the proper reaction. The reaction is most important. So we get back to that angle one. Just for the camera view, we're going to make it an angle six. So Alan goes to cut me in half. Okay, I'm doing my block. He cuts all the way through. In the moment that now he can swing again is where I choose to move in. And if you notice my block, I'm here. This is my center line arc concept. I'm at my shoulder line. And now I'm going to go forward. I can choose to go forward with my fist. I can choose to stay where I am and hit with my stick if need be. But that's not going to change the range. We're going to have the same exchange. If I specialize in Balintuak, Jiu Jitsu, and Wing Chun State, right? What I have to start understanding is I'm comfortable here. He or she may not be. So I want to get to a point where my training will help me dictate my self-defense. So I'm not just going to punch here. I'm going to move in. And no matter where I choose to hit with the stick, it's up to me. But it's not a massive hit. Notice it's just a quick little here. So I'm just coming to the side and stepping in. If you're way smaller than your opponent, this is why you must hit somebody. Stand back, please. Come closer. If I use a Wing Chun punch... He doesn't really move because it's short, because I'm thinking, oh, it's my arm that's going to do the work, or I have to go into my boxing to make him move. Well, why don't I just use my body? If I can step with my body and still create the same response, but using my whole mass to do so, now somebody that is shorter or smaller can do a lot more damage. So again, when he goes to cut, I'm here and I'm stepping in. Now I'm creating some more power on that. Again, what part of the stick that you hit is up to you? Fist, knife, middle, end of the stick, puño. Again, I don't care. I'm just making sure that there's something on target. But when I'm in this close range or this portal range, now there's a lot more I can do. 
Alan is going to attack. But if I'm attacking his head, he's going to be going for the opening here. So if I expect, and I have my training to be able to defend against that, now I can do something else. But this moment here is up to you to figure out. You probably have a thousand different disarms. I would always suggest the snake disarm, because the snake disarm is always going to be structurally stronger, and you're going to find yourself in that situation a lot. If you don't believe me, pressure test yourself. I'm not a big fan of disarms, but snake disarms come up a lot higher of a percentage than other things. So if we take that concept of trying to, again, walk and moving in, now you can play with whatever art that you have, whatever techniques you want to use. So anything on this side of the body, angle one, angle six, angle three or angle four, these upcutting motions, this is where I really love the decampo system. Is if Alan was say, if he was coming up on that angle three here, I love that the campo. I'm over here. See, and again, a training habit. What did he just do there? He went to hit my stick. Okay, he should be trying to hit me as a person. Okay, I believe Dufang and the snake is taking the head off the snake, not trying to hit the hand, because I've hit guys on the hands full out before and they hit drop shit. Especially when it came to training police officers, they're always like, oh, you knife this arms and stuff. I'm like, yeah, for sure. I love knife this arms. Let's play this. Let's go. And then one guy came up to me and he's like, uh, what if they tape the knife to their hand? And I was like, touche. Right. And it changed how I started thinking again. Just that one situation changed things back to the campus. So he comes up. Boom. I'm trying to hit the hand. Right. When I hit the hand, then I come back and I hit again. But that's not going to guarantee anything but I'm building my base responses for it. So again, something coming onto this side, I'm blocking. Something coming horizontally, I'm blocking and moving in as much as I can. When something comes up, I stay in the decampo range. When something comes down like an angle eight, I'm always stepping to the side if I have a stick. Or sorry, if I don't have a stick, if I have a stick, if I'm, my head's right here, sorry. I'm doing a reinforced block if I'm not moving. If I am moving, then I'm not doing a reinforced block and I'm looking to try and create an angle. But again, for me, that angle eight with a right leg forward stance should always be moving to the right. That's what that stance is built for. It's very hard to V-step. It's very slow to V-step. You have to move so much of your body. So for me, I always move to the right with that umbrella block. So now we're looking at angles two, seven, and anything basically on the backhand side of the body. So if I can get out of the way of this, or out of the way of this, I have now taken away the majority of their power. That means that they're only gonna be left with weaker strikes. I'm not saying it's a weak strike, I'm saying it's weaker than a full angle one. We all know that. So this is now where it gives me a chance to move in and at least get to a little bit more of an appropriate range. And Blintwalk Footwork does this well. If I'm in a right foot forward stance, I'm being led in blind talk. I'm going block and counter. If something's fed on this side, my right leg comes back and my left leg comes forward. When my left leg is forward and my left hand is forward, I'm still blocking my body, but now my live hand can get involved. Until I started really training blind talk and committing to it, my live hand was okay. It wasn't great though. A lot of the other Filipino martial art drills were good for it, but it didn't build it up as fast as the blind talk did. It also helped at the time I was training Wing Chun because it's all about abjection. So when he swings, I'd say angle six at me, and I'm here, and he goes to swing that seven, now my feet are switching and it's giving me a chance to again, get my live hand involved. Am I striking it? No, I'm learning to deal with the attack. I'm thinking about my block as much as I can. Is it always going to be perfect? No, not at all. It's very hard for us as human beings and in person, I've only seen it done once, and the dude must have had balls down to his knees because it was unreal. Um, I'm assuming he was a drug dealer. He went to go meet somebody, and the other guy in a crosswalk grabbed a baseball bat and came charging at him across the crosswalk. And this guy, this drug dealer, had a backpack on. And there was no stepping back. There was no stepping to the side. He went in without even thinking, without a doubt. He seen Buddy pick up the baseball bat and start swinging at him. And he just went in. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. 
I don't think that's a very natural response. I think that's something that you either have or you don't. You can definitely train it into you, but somebody's really got to swing a stick at you. So when I go for my empty hand stuff, I can't block now. If he swings at my head, nope, and one, cool. please. Right? I can try and duck out of the way. If he tries to cut off my legs, I can jump, right? Little drills that we do with the kids. But if he tries to cut me in half, I can't go up, I can't go down, I, I can move forward, but it's hard. So I have to move back. So in Wing Chun, they allow you to take one step back because sometimes people are going through better you. So if I take one step back, I must then move back in. So if he goes to swing at me, I'm back, and then again, I'm moving back in. That's hard, but you have to get good at it, so you have to train that. So there's lots of different ways that we can be thinking about our attacks. But in my mind, if I simplify it, if something comes on this side of my body, I'm blocking if it's up top. Something comes across horizontally, I'm blocking. I can choose to move in, but that's something else. That's a whole nother thing. We want to be winning the exchange right away. I consider winning the exchange when I'm not getting hit. If something comes up, I like with the campo stuff. If something comes on this side, I can block, but ideally, or most likely, somebody's gonna be coming in with their power side first and then to a two. And then you guys say, okay, well, what if he's left hand? Right? Well, that's why you have to train both sides. It's the same concept though. I'm blocking and then I'm moving in. But sometimes it's not that easy. So if you want to train anything, you should be training your footwork with a stick or without. If he comes in horizontally, here I can step in and come back right out of our 10 counts vibrato. Well, that's a great movement. But if I don't have my stick and he comes and he swings, again, I'm moving back, but you gotta train moving back. You gotta know that that's gonna work for you. If he comes up on that angle, I'm coming again with my decampo stuff or not. If he's coming straight down the pipe, I'm moving off into the side. Thanks, so. There's no guarantees in life, especially when it comes to the training aspect of things. What we have to master, in my opinion, is the ability to read the attack. And once your students can read the attack, then you have to pressure test it. Because if you're not pressure testing that attack, they're not going to know what it looks like at full speed. Yeah. So true. if your goal is to show them like, hey, this stuff works, then you have to show them that it does or does not work for them in that moment. Mm -hmm. And you have to build up their confidence in that as much as you can. But it takes time. Yeah. I don't care if you guys use my stuff. I don't care whatever you use. Because all I'm trying to share with people nowadays is concepts. Because yeah. you're going to love your teacher. You're going to love the martial art they teach. So ask for the same thing. Like, hey, I was successful in my block eight out of ten times today. Please go faster. Okay, I was successful now. And this is what I talk a lot about in my teaching is always drill until completion of drill. So if you have a new student, I'm going to resist that 1% and they're gonna complete the drill because there's four stages of learning. They have to memorize, then they have to be able to teach it, and then they have to work on the performance. And usually in performance, you're gonna have technical holes. If you have technical holes, then sometimes the performance. So these are very, very close to each other. But if they're at a point where they've memorized it and they can do both roles in it, now you should be pressure testing, you should be pushing it. But in my opinion, you don't want to create failure. It's going to be the most inefficient way of training. With good communication, you should be pushing them to that 1%, to that 20%, to that 40%. Then all of a sudden, that 60%, they're not doing it anymore. Dial it back down to 50. They're doing it now. Dial it back up to 60. Something's still going wrong. Okay, we got to take a look because there's something that's not being understood. Yeah, that's going to build up the confidence in the student and the confidence with each other and trust within each other that you can hit each other and know that you're still going to be okay. But we have to build those reactions and whatever reactions that you choose to teach your students is great. But you have to teach them that, like in in the punching and kicking world, it's circular and linear. Like yeah. that's, that's really it. In the Filipino martial arts world. It's 360 degrees, but there's weaker strength. 
now do they have two sticks and now do they have a knife? Like it, it changes and changes and evolves and becomes something so much more. So. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant demonstration, man. That was good. We liked it. Yeah. Is Eric there? So, uh, so we can. No, I'm just no. <laughs> no, I brought Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Is it Eric? laughs> uh, Eric's got a full time job. We keep telling him to commit to Buddha Brothers full time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and that's a good. That's a good point you guys brought up. A lot of people got like, what do you do with a student like uh, a working stiff like me? A guy who works uh, excess of. Uh, 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week. How do you, uh, how do you integrate? Like what kind of training do you like with that person that's as tired as shit when I get off work? Like, do you still go full? Like is your curriculum still full balls to the wall or you kind of just dial it down a little bit because you know, they're kind of fed the fatigue set in. I mean, if you're working 50, 60 hours a week, you got a family and you're tired, yeah. Yeah. go home. Get yeah. some rest. Right? But, like, but that's the same the same thing. You gotta put that sure. work in too. Because like me, yeah. like I chain like you probably look at my face, it looks like someone is like beat the shit out of me. But I uh, like I go to work at three o'clock in the morning every day and I get off work at around two thirty or whatever. Yeah. Um so I have to be I have to I have to drive seventy two miles. So I it's like an hour drive. So I have to get about two thirty in the morning. But I still when I get home, I, I still train for like an hour at least like later on in the evening. Um, but but I think that's where your your intensity of your training yeah. is mm. is where it just has to dial it down a little bit, right? Yeah. Because yeah. what what is it that you're trying to do, and what stage of learning are you at, right? For somebody like yourself, you're at the performance stage because you've already memorized everything, you understand yeah. that yeah. very well. Yeah. So now work on the performance. Well, the thing I've noticed a lot is like I I got a really bad back. I'm pretty messed up, right? So any kind of like massive amounts of footwork kill me. So I got maybe 10 minutes of like hard footwork training every day that I can put in. So then when I go to say, do that drill, right? Is it something to step back and step forward? Well, I know the drill that I'm doing in my head. So I'm going to step back and I'm going to get good at stepping back a hundred times. Then I'm going to step forward a hundred times. Then I'm going to go back and forward a hundred times. Mm. That's it. And that's going to be my footwork training for the day. And now it's like, okay, how am I feeling? But like, if my body's really sore and I don't have a lot, right? When I go to training, I just ask my students like, Hey, I'm not going to do the warm up today. I'm feeling a little bit out of it. I still want to get, excuse me, my training in. And I'm like, mm. awesome. Go shadow box for the first 10 minutes. Mm. Keep it super chill. Yeah. Do your drills, true. right? Just, just keep it chill. And then when you train, come doing all our technique stuff. So now he's just doing this. And now when we go do our pressure testing stuff, I'm like, go get a drink of water. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, like that we do have to find balance in our lives because the last thing we want to do is get injured and that's going to prevent us to train for the next three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh I, I know you've got like your your students coming in in a few minutes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for remembering. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think it's gonna be worth to have a second part. Sure. Yeah. If That's you guys are good. Yeah. That'd be. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I want I want to go into that that online program more, and then like I said, I really want to like go into like what your future goals are, and for sure, like, we need part two for sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, you're yeah. down for it. No, no pressure. Of course, of course. This is also, I mean, it's weird hearing myself talk and watching myself, but after the Buddha Brothers <laughs> stuff now, I'm like, okay, it's it's not as bad. So <laughs> you're definitely a guy like <clears throat> we need on. Like, I definitely like a one thousand percent respect you, thousand percent. Thank you. Um, everything you're doing. That's why I asked, you know, if you you know, we're honored to have you come on because the it. stuff you're doing, I want to share it with people. And I really want to I want to plug you real quick. Um to get for people that are watching that to check out his online program. Um, I mean, I know I'm, I'm over here, like I'm talking all kinds of shit. I haven't even bought it myself, but just what <laughs> I've seen it, it's great. Um, and I am going to get it. You know, I just got a lot of shit going on, but I will get the program. And I'm, I'm going to go through it. Um, but, uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to talk to the Buddha brothers. And yeah, if true. anybody that's watched on the Filipino martial arts discussion, I'll see if they can maybe hook up a discount or something like that. We'll get you guys a oh, code. Yeah. Look into so, it, guys. Watch his clips on the Budo Brothers. I think he has some clips on your page too, right? 
Yeah, if, if you follow me on Instagram, Kung Fu Goats. I, if you want, just go to my website, CalgaryGongFu.com. Yeah. I should have most of the links up there. Um, but yeah, like Instagram is definitely where you're going to see most of the martial arts stuff for sure. But yeah, Buddha yeah. Brothers, like BuddhaBrothers.com, yeah. go on there and you'll see everything. They got a lot of other really cool digital seminars as well with some really high level martial artists. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, check, check it out, everybody. Check it out. Like I said, I've seen a couple of clips and I was like, I, I, I got to talk to this guy. Yeah, I've here. seen I've seen a few yeah, ones as well. So, good stuff. Um, everything. Yeah. The whole gamut of martial arts. Not just MMA, right. like everything. So, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we, we could talk about the self defense stuff and it's, yeah, I love it. I love cool. It. cool. All right. So, um, before we lose you, <laughs> uh, have you got any um, words for for the Filipino martial arts community? Any word of advice? Always keep it fun. Always. Um, it's rare that you're going to find martial artists out there because they usually become teachers. It's rare that you're going to find martial artists that are going to push it as hard as you do, that want to train 40, 50 hours a week as much as you do. So at the end of the day, my goal is to create that environment and that community of people, and you have to have fun, right? That's, that's the number one reason why people will consistently come back, right? So as much as we're talking about, you know, like hitting people in the head with sticks and cutting them up with knives and choking them unconscious and breaking their arms and, you know, like at the end of the day, like you got to laugh, you got to have fun, you got to... You got to enjoy what you're doing. And, and if your students aren't necessarily leaving, smiling on a, on a couple jokes, or if you even just laughing at yourself for yeah. making mistakes or something like that, like, like go, go take some courses on, on how to become a better instructor. Um, for the students out there, every day you're tired, every day you're like, I know I should go, but you know, I'm just gonna sit at home on the couch. You're falling into a pattern. And you yeah. chose to start martial arts because you wanted to break that pattern. So break that pattern. Tell yourself, you know, it might be hard to get off the couch right now and sitting at home will feel okay, mm -hmm. but you're going to regret it tomorrow. So instead, get your ass off the couch, go and train for an hour, and everything goes up in your life. Your quality of life will just go through the roof. Just by being active, just by being around more people, We've been locked inside for two years, guys. It is time to get back out. It is time to engage. We are personal human beings. We yeah. need interaction with each other. So if you've never done Filipino martial arts or any martial art in general, go out and try something new. Go and try new schools. Go and just connect with people again because we, we need to, we had all this separation and segregation taking place and it's time for all of us to come back together and, and be a human race together. None of this race, gender bullshit, all that. Just come back together. And martial arts, like, I've been so lucky because one of my sensei's, like, best students was his daughter. And she beat the shit out of men. It was so awesome. Grown-ass men. So, like, people are always like, you know, like, isn't it weird doing jujitsu with a girl? I'm like, there's no girls or guys on the mats, guys. Mm, I'm like, there's a body good. that I need to choke the fuck out. <laughs> 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 yeah well i, 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 I yeah. completely agree yeah. okay okay right so on, yep uh, before your students start arriving thank you very much for 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 being and, a guest uh, yeah. yeah we'll chat about the second part of your interview yeah. okay sure Thanks yeah we're definitely have the second part all right, guys. Care, right. Enjoy the rest Take of the care. day. Train hard, guys. Take care. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye. Right. That was a good interview with Kevin, Brian. That was good. Be good. Yeah. I knew yeah. I need to have him on. I've seen his videos, and they're really in depth. I mean, like I said, I'm, eventually I'm going to purchase them when I my own training dies down. Start taking some different. But yeah, it was great. Good guy. Good guy. Okay. Excellent. Excellent choice. <laughs> Nah. Uh, yep. So, yeah, we'll we'll just have to sit down and go for, uh, for determine part the next two. Yeah. yeah, the part two. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. So, guys, tomorrow, uh, Dean has two interviews. I think. Is it two? Back, that was back one. interview. Yeah, yeah because uh, okay. there's one that's supposed to be yesterday, but oh, I okay. think they have to they have to move it uh, on the Thursday. I can't just remember who, but yeah. yeah. 
uh, stay tuned for tomorrow's uh, back-to-back interview with Dean Franco. The raffle, too. And the raffle, yeah, on Sunday. Is it Sunday? Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Sunday, yeah, guys. So you all, you all see our smiling faces on it. <laughs> even even Guru Dean, you'll see him on the team. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good one, Guru Tom. Have, have a good yep. night. Enjoy the rest good of night, your day. Everybody. Thanks for watching. Okay. Appreciate Thanks for it. watching, guys. Yep. See you next time. See you next time, guys.